Hi, I'm Ivory. So nice to have you here today. Our topic today is angelology. I've been wanting to share this with you for a long time. So uh, we'll be jumping into that in a minute. First, hello to my listeners in Prague and the Czech Republic. You know, I've had the privilege of visiting the Czech Republic on a trip and it was wonderful. I would like to go back. My brother's on his way now. So I'm um, so happy to have you here. Thank you for tuning in week after week. It means a lot to me. Let's talk about angelology. You might think it's a made up term. Interestingly, I did not hear this term until maybe 11, 12 years ago when I bought a book, which I'll share with you at the end. And I looked it up and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a real thing. And, and I was already into it. So I'm like, I'm an angelologist and didn't even know it. The term angelology comes from two Greek terms, angelos, meaning messenger or angel, and logos, meaning word, matter, or thing. So in today's topic, I will be referring to some religious texts, religious thoughts, and some more secular ideas on this topic as well. Uh, in Christian systematic theology, the term angelology is used to refer to the study of the biblical doctrine of angels. Include such topics as the origin of them, their existence, the nature of angels, classifications, the service they do, the works of angels, um, and it goes into more. You'll find out because we're going to cover a lot of that today. Uh, some theologians, however, treat Satan and demons under a separate heading, namely demonology. I keep that under a separate heading. I do not study demonology. I study angelology. The nature of angels. Uh, some of you might not have heard the episode where I talked about this. So I'm going to go even a little deeper into it. An angel is a spirit created by God and commissioned by him for some special purpose in according with his plan. Angels have enormous, though limited power and knowledge. They're presented by every religion as a link between God and mankind. I agree. To me, they're messengers of God. And spirituality is the connecting thread between all of them. Some scholars have denied the personhood of angels, but it's clear from scripture that they do indeed have personality. And I'm here to tell you, having talked to angels my whole life and heard them, they absolutely have personalities. And when I go, if you look back at some of my episodes where I focused on a particular archangel, I talk about their personality so that it'll help you recognize it when they come to you. Uh, they think, they make choices, they render intelligent and excellent praise and service to God. They're of a higher order than man, but inferior to Jesus. They're not sexual beings, and this is something I explain every time I do a um, meet your angelic guide session with somebody. It's like there's no him and her, but they do often have energy that can feel uh, masculine, feminine, or somewhat in that way, but they cannot procreate. Uh, the question of whether angels have gender comes up a lot, and the Bible does not specify it, but I will say that the angels mentioned in the scriptures usually have male names such as Michael or Gabriel, but um, my personal experience is that there are some that feel quite feminine. The traditional angelology shows that the purpose of the human being, the very reason for the incarnation we have on earth, is to reactivate these fields of consciousness within our being so you can express them in any situation. But the Bible points out that angels are very different from men and that they've never been and will never be human. God created angels just as he created men. However, archangels such as Metatron and his brother Sandalphon are sometimes mentioned. Um, they, it's believed they represent Enoch and Elijah's rise to angelic status, but there is nothing else out there, religious or secular, to indicate that any other human became an angel in any way. Darn it, my greatest goal shot down. In the Old Testament, angels are also referred to as the heavenly host, sons of God and holy ones. That first expression, heavenly host, relates to their innumerable number. There are so many angels and their power to defend God's people, us. The second expression, sons of God, highlights their close relationship to God. 
their godlike qualities. They can do things humans cannot think of doing. And the capacity in which they function before God. The third expression, holy ones, underscores the pure moral character of angels. Hence, when we say somebody is such an angel, they're being pure. The angelology linked to the Kabbalah defines God as a total unity represented through 72 fields of consciousness called angels. Each one of them represents qualities, virtues, and powers in their pure state. If you haven't figured it out already, I like to talk about many different religions, beliefs. Um, I'm very respectful of people's belief systems and like to include it because people have different beliefs, right? So it's only fair to talk about all of it. According to traditional angelology, an angel is a field of consciousness that lives in our minds in the form of divine potential. Angels are usually depicted as small children with wings, more like cherubs, to express what happens within our being when this celestial essence is reactivated and we rediscover our heart and our childish nature as well as a knowledge that allows us to travel freely and without restraint in the parallel dimensions of the universe. Many suggest that there are 72 angels and that they are the hidden treasure of the mysterious Ark of the Covenant. I, that is not my personal experience. My personal experience, they never come through as children with wings. Uh, until I was 12 or 13, they only came through as beautiful winged beings with lovely faces and flowing hair and robes. But um, now they rarely do. They usually just come through as beautiful beings of light, which I did do um, an episode about seeing angels. You might want to tune into that one. Check it out. I know there's some of you out there who are really interested in the classifications of angels. So I'm going to talk about that a bit. It's part of angelology. There is not a great deal revealed in scripture about the classification of angels. What is given does suggest there are ranks or classifications among them, but it's difficult to say much beyond that. They don't really go into details. The claim that some angels were confined to the abyss when they send and others was, were not is unlikely. All fallen angels are being held in pits of darkness until their appointed day of judgment, but they are able from there to carry out evil strategies against God, his people, and his creation. I always say when something terrible happens and people say, why would God allow that? God would not allow that. God does not want that to happen, but Satan's out there. Evil is out there. To me, those that's one and the same. Michael is referred to as an archangel, a designation not received by any other angel in scripture, though of course there are other archangels. This seems to indicate that he has authority over many angels and does so under the authority of God. He's also referred to as the great prince, where the term prince also seems to connote, connote levels of authority among the angels. While there's some debate over whether guardian angels exist, it seems there is an implication of it in the Bible in Matthew 18.10, if you want to look that up. And then there are the seraphim. I did a, an episode recently diving into that. They're mentioned just one time in scripture, so not much can be said about them. The term seraphim means burning ones and may allude to their brightness, yet it is interesting that they hid their feet and faces from the brightness of the Holy One. Therefore, it appears that they are deeply concerned about the holiness of God and worshiping him in humility. In Isaiah's case, they came to him and on behalf of God, communicated to him the knowledge that his sins were forgiven. Having been cleansed by the burning holiness of God, the prophet was now prepared to speak to a disobedient Israel on God's behalf. So that's, that's how it comes into the Bible. Cherubim are also mentioned numerous times in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament. They seem to be connected with protecting God's holiness and access to him in relationship. For this reason, they were stationed at the Garden of Eden, making it impossible for man to return to the garden and eat from the tree of life. Similarly, they are connected with the mercy seat and the law. It was there at the mercy seat that God met with sinful man. They are the living beings Israel saw in his vision. 
and the cherubim seem to have four wings and faces like lions, bulls, eagles, and human beings. They had human hands, feet like calf hooves. They shone brightly like burnished bronze. They are also associated with fire, lightning, and holy worship of the true and merciful God. I like to talk about the service of angels. This is like, what do they do? What's their role in the world of humans? It is impossible to describe all of the services which angels provide to us. There's just so many. But here are some of the following that they they help with. Um, They played a role in the coming death and resurrection of Jesus. They delivered the message to Mary that she was going to have the Christ child, and they proclaimed him a savior before the shepherds. They ministered to Jesus during the period of his wilderness temptations, just as they strengthened him in his Gethsemane trials. They were also ready at his command to fight for him. Further, they rolled away the stone from his tomb, and they also proclaimed his resurrection. So um, lots of mentions in the Bible about what angels have done in history. As far as what they're doing now, um, I encourage you to listen to all the different episodes I did. Again, uh, focusing on individual archangels because I go into great detail about the specific areas of human life each one is in charge of. And it helps you to know if you if you're having a specific issue in life, then you're going to want to go to the archangel, ask for help from them, the one who's in charge of whatever's going on, relationships, health, you know, things to do with children. You know, there's there's just many, many things. The writer of Hebrews summarizes the role of angels in the lives of believers and not all angels ministering spirits sent to help those will inherit salvation. As such, they are vitally interested and involved in our own spiritual growth. Uh, It's said that they will, when God desires, encourage us and even rescue us from physical dangers. They certainly have rescued me from physical danger more than a few times. Uh, I don't really understand why I'm still here, but I can only think it wasn't my time. So thank you, angels. Angels are deeply interested in the salvation of those who are lost and rejoice when somebody turns from doing dark activities, things that hurt people to the light. Uh, There's said that Philip was commissioned by an angel to go and meet the Ethiopian eunuch on the desert road so that this man could be saved. Angels are also involved in caring for believers when they die. And I'm going to tell you, um, having spoken to so many angels, they care for all of us when we cross over it, whatever you believe, you know, uh, they're going to care for you. They're even going to care for the worst in humanity because the goal is to help them be better, to learn, to see their mistakes. So, uh, It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter your faith. It only matters that you do the best you can, be the best person you can, but your angels will still care for you when you cross. I do want to talk about Satan because he's a fallen angel. The term Satan means adversary in the Hebrew Bible, and the New Testament writers simply brought that name over into Greek without any changes. Satan is a fallen, wicked angel. He might be a cherub. There's some thought about that, although that's by no means certain. Angelology narrates that Lucifer, after rebelling against God and falling from heaven, took a third of the angels with him to hell, according to the interpretations of the book of Revelation by St. John, the last book of the Christian Bible. Actually, the prophetic book describes how In quotes, the enormous red dragon swept a third of the stars out of the sky with his tail. So I thought that was an interesting detail. Is angelology a religion? Absolutely not. It is a field of study in the theological science and actually even in the secular belief system of angels. However, throughout history, there have been religious or sectarian movements who focused on angels and archangels, and accordingly, the cult of the angels can be highlighted, since they worship the angels and believe that these should be imitated in life, for they are the utmost example of divine enlightenment. I can't argue with that. I would like to be as good as the angels are. 
Also, the community of the Brethren of the Angelic Life can be mentioned in this instance. It was a sect founded by Johann George Geichtel in the 17th century, which supported the idea of reaching the angelic life through mysticism. The followers of this sect refrained from marriage and all earthly activities. I think that's misguided. I... I know that was their choice, but angels do say over and over. They're telling me constantly not to work all the time. They are encouraging me, get outside, go see people you love, go see your friends, go sing. You know, life is more than just working. We're supposed to have relationships with people. It's a big part of how we're learning our lessons here. Some religious scholars point out that angels, which are created like men, should not be worshipped or prayed to because in this way, they would deprive God of the glory that only belongs to him. According to that theory, it was God who sent his son to die for the salvation of the world, who loves human beings and cares for them, and therefore he's the only one worthy of any kind of worship and not an angel. I will say, angels have told me many times that First, they told me, please don't pray to them. They said, that's just for God. I respect that. So I didn't do that. And I tell my clients, my students, the same thing. Make requests, express your gratitude, under, let them know you're so grateful for the things that they've brought into your life that they do for you, but you only pray to God. Types of angels according to angel hierarchy. Here we go. Let's dive into this. For Christians, angelology provides God's perspective on angels. Angels are beings who worship and obey God and are sometimes sent to mediate in human affairs. According to angelology, there are nine choirs divided into three orders of angels. The first order includes those angels that have a direct contact with God. They are the seraphim. Angels of light, love, and fire that work for the purification and dissipation of darkness and doubt. I love that. And the cherubim, they're angels that represent heavenly science and wisdom. And then the thrones who bring divine justice and whose virtue is humility. In the second order, there are the dominions who care for the lower angels and regulate their duties, the virtues who inspire humanity and rule over the natural laws and the powers who protect consciousness and history and guide souls to heaven. And finally, in the third order, there are the principalities who guide and enlighten angels and archangels, the archangels who are God's special messengers to men and the angels who are protectors and messengers of men. I will need to tell you though, like when angels come to me and, and they do, I mean, even outside of sessions with clients, when angels come in, the frequency is really high, but archangels is far higher. So um, even within that order, I think they're much more powerful than regular angels are. In conclusion, you are practicing angelology right now, listening to my podcast or watching it on YouTube. And by reading my blog, with either or both of these activities, you've begun the study of angels. I encourage you to continue, dig in. I am constantly finding new, interesting information. Um, join my Patreon page for in-depth information. I'll be talking, I'll be putting so much information on there about angels, of course. Um, I want to introduce you to what got me started and introduce the term angelology to me. It's a book. I'm going to show it to you so you can see what it looks like. It's called Angelology. I'm trying to get it in a player. Let me put it over my face. So those of you who are not watching, who are listening, it's called Angelology by Danielle Tresoni. And it was published in 2010. So I've actually known about this 13 years then. Um, I want to read to you a little bit of what it's about, because if you were into angels, and why would you be watching the show if you're not? I think this book will give you so many beautiful chills. It is just so beautiful. It's not completely accurate to how angels work, but I got to tell you, there's a lot of things in there that are just so incredibly beautiful. It's a book. I don't save a lot of books anymore. I'm actually getting rid of things, but I'm, I'll reread this one every few years. So let me read you what it's about. 
Sister Evangeline was just a girl when her father entrusted her to the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration in upstate New York. Now at 23, her discovery of a 1943 correspondence between the late Mother Superior of St. Rose Convent and the famous philanthropist Abigail Rockefeller plunges her into a secret society that stretches back a thousand years, an ancient conflict between the Society of Angelologists and the monstrously beautiful descendants of angels and humans, the Nephilim. For the secrets the Rockefeller letters guard are desperately covered by these once powerful creatures who stop at nothing to perpetuate war and subvert the good in humanity. Almost since human civilization began, these uncommonly tall, fair figures have moved undetected between the behind the seats of power throughout the world and have been tracked in stealth by generations of angel scholars, the angelologists, who have devoted their lives to stopping them. This mission is steeped in reality shadowed by the divine supernatural. It haunts every corridor of Evangeline's Hudson River Abbey, pierces the innocent world of an art historian's research, and casts archaeological treasures in Paris and New York in an astonishing new light. All the while, deep in a Bulgarian mountain cave, the Nephilim's angelic forefathers illuminate the stalactite bars of their prison with a radiance of an altogether different sort, a perpetual glow that is as deadly as it is irresistible. It, there's some goofy things in it, but there's some things that are pretty darn real and true. And it's one of those books you just can't put down. So I thought I'd share it with you since we're on that topic of angelology. And hopefully this show inspires you to start really digging in. Um, next Sunday, the topic is take a break from stress. That's not an order. I'm going to be explaining how you can do that. And the world is just so darn stressed. Everybody's at a very high stress level without anything extra happening. So anything I can do to help you reduce your stress, to feel better, to deal with all the chaos going on, I want to help you. So in the meantime, may your angels surround you. May your angels protect you every moment, every day of your life. I'll see you next week.